excited about the word. I'm praying that uh, God will do something special in our hearts and our lives. I'm also hoping that you are taking notes. I'm hoping that you got your phone app out of where you going got your little note that that is. Anybody need a pen? We got lots. Because it's just important not just to hear and be like, oh, that was good and go home. But this is for us to meditate on, to think about. So when Thursday comes, you're not just like, what was Sunday about? This is something that we're talking about and we're ruminating over, amen? Um, Our uh, scripture today comes from our lectionary passage. It's in John 1, St. John 1. I know we have the electronic Bible, the big Bible that's going to be on the screen. But, you know, if you have it, I mean... Sometimes you should have your own word out just to make sure you need to be checking that we, we, we saying what it say. I could be telling you something whole different. You wouldn't even know different. Y'all didn't even look in your own Bible. So yeah, it's good to have some checks and bias. Look and see if what it was saying is for your own self. We are, uh, in, first, we are in John, first chapter. It's a very, um, it's a good passage. So it reads... And I believe this is in the NIV version. It reads, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Somebody say, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Oh, I wish I had time just to park right there. Just so you know that we know where you come from don't always equals where your destiny is headed, right? Even when people count you out and say, oh, where they go? What school they go to? What what city they from? What hood you from? Where you from? Where you represent? What set you, this could turn into a real like set tripping, right? But it doesn't matter. Jesus came from an unlikely place. And this is what I'm hoping that you say to all your friends. After you experience the presence of God in this place, after you experience the glory of God for yourself, tell your people, come and see. What you guys got going on at that church? Good look. Come and see. Is Jesus all that like? No, huh? Come, come and see. Come see for yourself. Come and see. All right, moving on to verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, Nathanael said to him, "Um, Sir, how do you know me? I'll just be calling out my business. Like, how do you know me? What did it, wait. Do you know, do I know you? Have we met? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And I could just imagine Jesus just kind of laughing at him a little bit like, boy, all right. Jesus answered him, says, oh, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree. Do you believe? Let me tell you something. You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Can you tell your neighbor you ain't seen nothing yet? Tell the other one you ain't even ready. You thought thought that was... Oh, you was impressed with what God did in 2023? Oh, you, oh, you ain't even, oh, you believe because of that? You believe because God paid a light bill? Oh, okay. Okay. That's why, okay. 
You ain't, you got in the entry level program. Jesus like, I got, oh, okay. I'm about to blow your mind. Our subject today is called Get Dusty. My favorite preacher, Jacqueline Thompson, where Pastor Mike is, she always says, I know you, want, you don't understand, and I like it that way. <laughs> Get dusty. Get dusty. Can you imagine in this year of 2024, if you were a young person and you opened the Bible for the first time and you saw Jesus in this passage, just walk up to random people and say, follow me. Can you imagine the context that a young person has for that with social media these days? Oh, so they'd be like, yeah, so I got it. Like, follow me. Like, like, and, like and subscribe. Like, hit the notification bell. Right? What is the context of follow me in this day and age? When you follow someone, how many people are on social media? Because some of y'all might have gave it up. I don't know. How many on IG? Uh-huh. Facebook, you're the old saints on Facebook. Come on, we, we got to have the reliable people. On. We still holding it down. Have you seen Facebook? Y'all do. Uh-huh. So some people didn't want to say it. You know you be checking that Facebook every now and then. TikTok, you got any TikTok subscribers? Like and subscribe. Mm -hmm. YouTubers. Ooh, you get on YouTube, you ain't never coming back for like about two hours. You're going to be gone down a whole nother path. All right. So in, in, in our context of this social media society, to follow someone means that you signed up to get their content. You like what they got going on. You like they look or you like what they're talking about. Right? And you, I just want to, I want to uh, be a part of whatever you're putting out. I want to be able to, to see what you're doing. Right? Like, you have to continue to be a part of the algorithm. You got to keep the, you got to keep feeding the beast. I don't know. That's a lot to be a content creator. You got to keep feeding that thing. Right? So that means, like, you, and you know, I'm here for it. I want to uh, choose to see all the things that you have. But there are several accounts in the Bible, if you start reading the, the Gospels, several accounts where Jesus just walks up to random people and tells them these magic words, follow me. He walks up to fishermen. He walks up to people while they're working at their desk as tax collectors. They are in the, in the process of working. And Jesus says, follow me. And it almost feels like it's like some hypnotic trance. Like, he says, follow me, and they just drop everything, and they just start. <laughs> That's how it kind of like, it, it reads. Like, I was just fishing, and then I'm like, oh, now, I'm, I'm, okay, we're going with him. It always puzzled me. Did these people just, they just dropped everything mid-activity? Jesus walked up to them, and they was like, all right, bet. And they just, y'all didn't pack? Did you take a lunch? Did you, did you have extra clothes? I just, it's a lot. I'm, I, I'm just perplexed. So what does it really mean to follow Jesus? If we, if we, equaled it to social media standards, that means that anything Jesus does that I don't like, I could just unfollow Jesus. I don't like you said that, Jesus. I'm going to unfollow you. I don't want to see it no more. You said what? Oh, you want me to be nice to the person? Unsubscribe. You want me to give? Oh, no. Blocked. If that's how we, if we take it in this context, we would treat Jesus in this way if we think that that's the meaning of following someone. If Jesus did anything, I'm going to put the comments in, in the comment section of my life and tell Jesus all about how I don't like what Jesus just did. I didn't like that plan. I want it my way. I'm going to put that in my comment section of my life. But if you grew up in Palestine, in the same time where Jesus walked the earth, this phrase took on a whole different meaning. And I would love to talk to you all about it as a community. So y'all ready? Y'all ready? So Jesus, when he was a little boy, around six years old, along with every other little Jewish boy, every other little Jewish six-year-old, went to a local synagogue school called Bet Sefar. 
and which meant house of a book. And as a child, they would usually attend Bet Safar from the age of six to 10. Any elementary school teachers here? Mm-hmm, look at it. Yep, these are your babies. This is what you would have, right? And you know how six to 10 year olds are. During this time, good Jewish boys memorized the Torah. What's the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They would have it fully memorized by the age of 10. That's crazy. I could barely remember my passwords. <laughs> they memorized whole books of the Bible. Okay, so then they would progress from Bet Safar, and then they would continue from the age of 10 to 14 and attend Bet Talmud. During this time, the student would continue his memorization of the Psalms, the prophets, and the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament. It wasn't uncommon in that day for a good Jewish boy to have the complete Old Testament memorized by the age of 14. What are we doing with our kids now? Like, what? Isn't that amazing? Completely memorized. This was a part of their life. They were going to keep their traditions and their laws going, and this was just understood. Now, at the end of your study from Bet Talmud, when you were about 13 to 14 years old, you would, if you were the best of the best, only if you were the best of the best, you would present yourself to a well-known and respected, powerful rabbi. All Jewish boys wanted to be a rabbi because the teachers were the most respected people of their day. This is what they aspired to. They didn't want to be basketball players, football players. They didn't want to be a famous rapper. They didn't want to be an influencer. They were like, I want to be a rabbi. I'm going to do all I can to be a rabbi, right? Uh, so, uh, if, you were, um, if you were ready to be at that point, you would say to a rabbi, hey, I want to become your disciple, your Talmudin, your student. Please let me be in your bet midrash, which is your house of study. And then at the end, the rabbi would ask you all types of questions to find out if you were indeed the best of the best. Are y'all tracking with me? This is the matriculation process of a, of a Jewish boy. Um, it says, and then if the rabbi quizzed you and determined that you were good enough, he would say, come, take my yoke upon you and become my disciple. Hmm, sounds familiar. At that time, the boy would leave everything, home, mother, father, synagogue, community, and devote his entire life to being just like the rabbi and would follow him everywhere. You with me? All right. To follow a rabbi means that you would be living with the rabbi, sharing life with him, taking part in the rabbi's whole day. A disciple might accompany a rabbi on all his daily routines, prayer, study, Debating other rabbis, giving alms to the poor, burying the dead, going to court. The list goes on and on. A rabbi's life was meant to be a living example of someone shaped by God's words. Disciples, therefore, studied not just the text of the scripture, but the text of the rabbi's life. This is what they would do. And upon commissioning, if the rabbi accepted you, he would tell the disciples or his students, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. If a rabbi came to the village, right behind him would be these Talmudin following right behind him. All the roads were dusty back then, so these disciples who followed their rabbis so closely, they would follow their rabbis so closely that they would be covered in the dust of their rabbi. This is a good time for my first praise break <laughs> to ask, how dusty are you? 
How dusty are you? Some of us is we way too clean. We too fresh and too clean. We ain't, we ain't got no dust. I'm on the couch chilling. Right? How dusty are you? Ooh, now, I'm going to let you sit in that for a little bit. Now, there's always a possibility that a rabbi um, would decide that after quizzing you, that you were not ready for the Harvard or Yale of the Jewish community. Right? He would say, obviously, you know the Torah, but you don't have what it takes to be just like me. Go, make babies. Pray that they become rabbis and ply your trade. Go learn the family business and live a good life that your sons may grow up and be better than you. He's out there snatching it like, ooh. I guess that's a no. All right, let me go on with my life, right? That's a, so everybody didn't make the cut. Everybody didn't get in. So we can tell based on this. Um, so in our text today, our text today, this is why our text today is so exciting. Our text today, we see Jesus picking his disciples. And they're all out working. They're all out doing something. Why? Because they didn't make the cut. Peter and them out fishing, working for their dad. Andrew and them, they just out under fig trees. Nathaniel, he would get tax collectors, which, by the way, were the hate, most hated. I think I talked about this before. They hated tax collectors because they had sided with the Roman Empire. And they was like, hey, you want to make money? They're like, yeah. Well, you just collect money, but you can take whatever cut you want. So they would just be taken from their own people. You done sided with the enemy. You with the man. And then, so they hated cats, tax collectors. And yet Jesus would just walk up to people like Matthew and be like, hey, what you doing? Follow me. Let's go. And he would drop everything. They didn't make the cut. A rabbi probably told them that they weren't the best of the best and sent them to apply their trade. Jesus goes to the losers and the rejects, and he calls them. This is why this text is so exciting. As we can tell, based on the context, several of the disciples had to be in their late to mid-teens. Think about this. See, because all the movies got them as grown men with beards and rough and all. They, they, from this context, they were probably mid to late teens. Peter had a mother-in-law, and, a, and usually by the age of 18, a boy would be married. By 18. So Jesus calls teenage rejects and ordinary second-class people to be his disciples, and he continues to call them today. How many glad about this? is my praise break number two. How many people are glad that Jesus is still in the business of not just going to, after the best of the best, but would come to a little nobody's, little ordinary people like us and call us to a great work? Now, I've always had questions about uh, Heaven's PR team. Because I'm wondering, this is a big mission here. We're literally saving the world. Do we not want to get the best students of the day of the people who were studying the Talmud and the things? Did we not want those? Okay, no, we scratched that, and we're going to go after fishermen and people sitting under fig trees. I love the way heaven works. It gives us hope. It gives us hope. I'm so glad God calls rejects. This means you got to start looking at people different. Because you done rolled off a few people and told them they ain't going to never be nothing. You're going to be just like your daddy. You know, all that. (laughs) 
that means you're gonna have to rephrase some of your your framework, your narrative. Because if you are a reject, you are on the candidates list, the best top candidates list in heaven. Hallelujah. How many are glad about that? That you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to always get it right. How many got a testimony that I done messed up a lot of times? I didn't make the best decisions. I didn't do the right things. I went over there and I knew it was wrong and I still went. And still, God sees. God saw him. Saw him, saw him. Now, this is what I love. According to the narrative that we just had, students were supposed to reach out to the rabbis. Here we see Jesus doing it in reverse order. Renee already had got the revelation. Jesus did something so revolutionary. He goes and asks the people to be his disciples, not the reverse. They were supposed to, the rabbis just walking like, if anybody talk to me, then they ain't going to get in. Jesus was like, no, hey, hey, you, you over there, come follow me. Isn't that amazing? He comes after us. We, also, we often say, like, I found Jesus. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> He's actually already predestined us before the foundations of the world. How many are glad about it? I'm glad about it. So when you see Jesus approaching these people and they drop everything, you have to understand that Jesus was a rabbi. That means Jesus had did all the steps. Like Jesus did all the things. He was excellent at what he did. He was already considered a rabbi, right? He's calling his disciples. He thinks that they are good enough even though others did not. He's giving them a chance to fulfill their dreams. So of course... They drop everything they're doing to follow the rabbi. It all makes sense now. Their parents and family-owned businesses often depended on them, but you see them offering no resistance. You see them not chasing after them like, boy, you know we got more nets to... You don't see any resistance because it was an honor to have your son follow a rabbi. A matter of fact, you became the talk of the village. Yeah. Uh, you know my Andrew, my Andrew, he got, he got called. <laughs> the rabbi said, come follow him, man. And Nathaniel, oh my gosh. Yeah, that's my boy. Yeah. They were excited. Can you imagine? Come on, use your holy imagination and just think you're working every day. You're doing your nine to five, thinking that this is your purpose and this is all that life has for you. And then Jesus sees you and calls you to something greater, something greater than yourself. To a movement, do you know we are all sitting in this building right now because of the witness of those 12 people? We are here. Because this little ragtag team of, of misfits was faithful yeah. to the word. Faithful. Amen. Amen. So when they hear, follow me, you can imagine them saying, this is my chance. Yeah. I thought my chance had passed. I thought, I, I thought I, no one saw me. Jesus sees something in me. And Jesus was calling all types of people. Child, let me tell you. He had the zealots who were revolutionaries, the tax collectors, the working men. He had the smart ones. He had the ones that he even called his own traitor. He knew. He always, we said the hater, there was a hater in the clique that Jesus even called because he saw something in them. So to truly follow Christ, what does it mean in our context today? What does it mean to truly follow Christ? Because he has, he has to become everything to us. Everyone follows something. Y'all hear me? Everyone follows something. I don't care if you think you're your own person, you're standing on your own two feet, you're standing on your business, whatever you're doing. Everyone follows something. They follow uh, people, they follow culture, they follow friends, they follow their own selfish desires, you follow your family, 
or you can follow God. So my first point, how do we follow Jesus? Is that we can only follow one thing at a time. Think about this. You can only follow one thing at a time. One thing at a time. All right. Can I can I get my two brothers? Y'all, hi brothers. Can y'all can y'all help me with this real quick? Can y'all come here for a second? Stand up. Yep. Let me get one more. Let me get one more. Oh, but come on, come on, brother Juan. And oh no, it's okay. It's, and brother Terrence, can I have you come come up? All right. Can y'all y'all scoot up a little bit and you come over here, right here, brother Juan. Yep, yep. You stand here. Come on, brother Terrence. You can, uh, huh? Let's go. Oh yeah, all the things. All right. It is, all right, that's right. I, call, I could call any Terrence and like three with a K. Right, <laughs> coach, y'all stretch your hands to this one because we all need you. No, just kidding. <laughs> kidding! <laughs> all right, so I'm going to um, have Brother Maurice and Brother Juan, can y'all come right here? Y'all just stand right here. Mm-hmm, step back. And parents, you stand in the back of them right here. Now, y'all, I'm going to give you a charge, Coach Terrence. I want you to follow them. All right, hold on. Follow them. Ready? Follow them. Follow them. That the way. It, the way it, follow, with, I want you to follow them collectively. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Point blank. Clap it up for the fellas. Thank you. You can only follow one thing at a time. You can't follow multiple things. He, has to, he had to make a choice. The Bible says no one can serve two masters. Either you hate one or you love the other. You're devoted to one or you despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's a whole nother sermon. But somebody, I needed to drop that on somebody's spirit. Only one at a time. Who will you give your energies to? Who will you give your intentionality to knowing that you can only follow effectively one thing at a time? All right, second point, how do we follow Jesus? There's no such thing as a halfway disciple. No such thing as a halfway disciple. According to Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. These are the words of Jesus. According to how we found out how Jewish culture perceived following a rabbi, there was no such thing as a halfway following this rabbi. Like, I holla at you, rabbi. I'll see you on Tuesdays. Every second of the month, I'll come and hang out with you. You, were, you would not be considered a true disciple. You were to take on the life of that rabbi. You can't be halfway. You couldn't be sitting on the couch and following him at the same time. It's intentionality. We talked so much about that in the last year. Intentionality. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross. Take up a, this is, this is, now this is a, this is a whole thing because following Jesus will cost you everything. You got to know that. I think sometimes we give false narratives, like come to Jesus, your life will be amazing. And it will, but you, you going, you going to go through some things. You're going to, do you know what taking up your cross Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't a pretty sight. It was a sacrifice. It cost him everything, just like we're talking about Martin Luther King Jr. today. His, his stand for freedom cost him everything. He knew it. He said, I might not get there with you. Because he knew it was going to cost him his life dealing with these folks. It'll cost you everything. So I don't want to give you a false hope or to lead you astray and you get into it like, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I thought I'm doing all the things on the church every Sunday and nothing happening and I have everybody acting crazy at home. I don't know if I want to do this. If you go into it knowing, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm surrendering my life. Like this is not, this is not a light decision. 
If you're going to make a decision to follow Jesus, you got to count the cost. It's going to cost you your will. It's going to cost you your way. It's going to cost you your preferences. It's going to cost you. We own this consecration. It's going to cost me my, my sweets and my ham sandwich and my, my green. My, oh, Lord. So this is the question. Are you a believer or are you a Christ follower? This is important to, to know. Are you a believer or a, cross, a, 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 a Christ follower? It's so good to be a believer. I believe in Jesus. Yes. Most of us will raise our hand and be like, do you believe in him? Like, yeah, sure. I believe in Jesus. That's kind of base level. I believe in Jesus. But there's levels to this. You can believe in Jesus and not be a Christ follower. I believe in the man. You know, there's several religions who say Jesus is a great prophet, that we have uh, evidence that he actually walked this earth. Yeah, I believe in Jesus, sure. But the line of intentionality, you cross it when you become a follower. When you intentionally spend your life following after the life of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So third point, no one can follow Christ by the strength of their own willpower. You got to know this because resolutions are on an all-time high right now. And we have committed ourselves to do things that are hard, and we said we're going to do it in about March. And be like, oh, yeah, I forgot I said I was going to do that, right? So it's not this Christian life is not about willpower. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be nicer. I'm going to stop doing all the things, right? It's more about relying on another power. So the Pharisees were good examples of those who try to obey God in their own strength. Their self-effort only led to arrogance, and they distorted. The whole purpose of God's law was that to look at the law as a mirror and then find out, Lord, I just really need you because I can't do it all. But they, they took it on as a badge of honor, and be, it became performative. Watch me do all these things, even though there was nothing going on on the inside. So Jesus said, how do we do this? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. We think the original disciples had the advantage because they had a physical form of Jesus. But this verse actually tells us that we have the advantage because Jesus is no longer here physically. It was, it's just, it was geographically, how can we all have Jesus? across the whole world. It's a whole lot. But he's like, I got you an advantage. If I go away, you gonna get a helper. You get a helper, you get a helper. We all get a helper. And that helper is the very spirit of Jesus. The spirit of Jesus lives inside of us. And it says that that helper will bring all things back to our remembrance, what Jesus has spoken. We can't do it on our own. We need help from the Holy Spirit. So. Last point, how do we follow Jesus? That's all good and well and fine. You know, many people have moved away from the Christian terminology. When you say, hey, what are you? Am I a Christian? Most people, you know, there's been so many uh, hard narratives throughout our history. A lot of things done in the name of Christianity that were very harmful. A lot of crusades, a lot of colonization. A lot of things were done in the name of Christianity by flawed people, amen? So a lot of people, that brings up a lot of trauma and triggers when you say, I'm a Christian. So a lot of people are leaning into more like, I'm a believer, or taking that intentional step and saying, I'm actually a follower of Jesus. So how do we follow Jesus? We must accept the rabbi's invitation. The rabbis in those days were very demanding, as you can see. They had so many rules, so many traditions, so many scriptures to memorize, They would just, you know, you had to be on point at all times. It was very performative. But Jesus says, and I love that we now have framework to what he said when he says, take your yoke on, take my yoke on you. He was actually quoting rabbis of that day saying, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For what? I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart. 
You'll find rest for your souls. How many people need rest for their souls? You've been up all night tossing and turning. You can't go to sleep. You have insomnia. Your thoughts are just spinning continually. Jesus is saying, I can provide rest for your souls. For his yoke is easy and his burdens light. It's light. It's a beautiful thing. So if, you're, if, it's, if it feels heavy, you're probably leaning on the religion side. Religion feels very heavy. You got to wear this. You got to say that. You got to do this. You can't wear that. You can't take that off and put this on. Act like this and don't go there. Right? Jesus is like, no, no, I got you. It's light. It's easy. It's easy. He came not with an endless list of rules and regulations, but with an easy yoke. And so the last point is, if you want to follow Jesus, this is so important. My brothers and sisters, you need to study the life of Jesus. It's imperative if you're calling yourself a Christ follower. Who follows somebody they don't know? What, 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 what do you know about Jesus? Is it just what your granny told you? What your Sunday school teacher told you? What the preachers are telling you? You have to study the life of Jesus for yourself. Study his tendencies. What did Jesus do? Read his words. How does he typically respond to situations? How does he respond to conflict? How does he show his love for people? Who does he reach out to the most? How does he treat the marginalized? How does he handle when people reject him? How does he handle when people talk about him? How do, where does he go when he needs rest? How does he teach? We say we follow Jesus and don't know nothing about what he did or said. Study the life of Jesus. Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read all about it. It's different ways, different views of Jesus from four different perspectives. Read about Jesus. Get to know him. This is why Jesus didn't simply invite his disciples to listen to his preaching in the synagogues. He said, come follow me, and basically invited them on a three-year camping trip. They traveled from village to village throughout Galilee as he was preaching the kingdom of God. So this is my question, and this is my proclamation, and this is my declaration over you. It's time to get dusty. It's time to get dusty. Come on, say it. It's time for me to get dusty. Turn to somebody and be like, hey, it's time to get dusty. You looking a little too clean. It's time, to, it's time to get dusty. It's time for us to follow directly behind our rabbi. Wherever our rabbi goes, we are right behind him doing what he's doing, exemplifying what he would do, living out his tendencies. It is time for us to get dusty. This is my prayer over you. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Amen. Amen. Here are our reflection questions that you could take with you. And these are good, yeah, these are good questions just to sit with throughout the week. And we'll talk about it on Tuesday also. Have you decided to follow Jesus? And this is the important thing. Why? Why? <laughs> Are we, we trying to get, we got um, fire insurance. That's why I just, I'm just making sure it's all good. I mean, if I leave here, I ain't going to, you know, to the other place. Because that's how it's usually preached to us. You need Jesus so you don't go to hell. And I, I'm, I'm here for it. I'm, I'm gonna, I got my fire insurance. Don't worry about me. But why? Why? Why are you following Jesus? Is it for what you can get out of it? Like, so here's my life, God, and I just need you to sign off on it. Or have you surrendered your life and given Jesus an empty slate and be like, I don't even know what I, my life has proven that I don't make good decisions and I don't know what I want. <laughs> so I'm going to give you my life and you write what you want. For me, why do you follow Jesus? And if you're not a Jesus follower, why not? It's a good question to ask yourself. 
Are you a believer and a Christ follower? What do you consider yourself to be and what's the difference? Ask yourself, do I just believe in Jesus or am I intentionally following Jesus? Lastly, how can you commit to learning more about Jesus' tendencies in 2024? How can you commit to learning more? Not just on this Sunday. Sunday don't count. I'm taking that off your list. Sundays don't count as your tendency uh, research, right? What are you doing on your own to know more about Jesus? Amen. Let's all stand as we pray over this word. And I'm going to actually offer in our time, I'm going to offer you to do something really radical and really um, brave if you are here and you don't remember a time that you have committed your life to Jesus. Yes, thank you. I was going to ask you for that. I want you to take a very brave step and I want you to meet me at this altar if you want to make a decision today to follow Jesus for the first time. And I also, I love making a big call like this, not bow your head and close your eyes, because we don't live in a bow your head, close your eyes type of society. If you're going to do something, you need to do it big, and you need to do it brave, and you need to do it bold. Amen? That's how you're like, no, I'm taking I don't care who see me, who I'm walking down this aisle, because I want to give my life to Jesus, not secretly, but in front of my community. Amen? So if there's anyone here, there's absolutely no pressure. But if you are here and you say, this is my moment, I want to give my life to Jesus, meet me at this altar. We'll be glad to have you. And at the same token, if you are here and you're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus or I want to join uh, a church home, I need to be a part of a community. I want you to meet me here also. So God, we commit this message to you. We commit that it is falling on good soil. God, we want to start our year talking about Jesus, thinking about Jesus and the ways that we can follow him. So we solidify our decision to follow you. We say as a community that we have made a choice, that we will sustain our choice, that we will nurture our choice, that we will study about our choice, that we are going to intentionally follow Jesus all the days of our lives. May our lives be covered in the dust of our rabbi. God, will you help us by the power of your Holy Spirit? We can't do it on our own. We need you, God. So we thank you for our community. We thank you for this church. And God, we say we are committing our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank God. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus.